So now that Easter has concluded and we were in the series during Easter about amazing grace, grace is still amazing, we concluded that last week um, and we are jumping right back on the Abram train. We have been studying before that for about eight weeks this series um, entitled Called to Cross Over, looking at the life of Abram in the Old Testament and the book of Genesis, digging down deep into the happenings of his life, asking questions about what do we learn from him, how he walked with God, how he talked with God, and applying it to our lives still yet today. The idea of crossing over is found in Abram as a person, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I did the first couple Sundays, but in Abram we see this unique crossing over of God's relationship with humanity. And so we're digging deeper into that today. We're looking at an episode of Abram's life where he's simply invited to believe. That's it. Nothing complicated, no extra features, just an invitation to believe, right? And don't forget where we left Abram when we left off. He had just gone and rescued his nephew Lot, right? Abram by this point is a pretty wealthy and powerful man in his area. He heard that his nephew and all the rest of his family had been carried away basically as prisoners. So he got together some kingly friends of his, and they went out, and they not only conquered the enemy, they brought all the family back home. In addition to that, a whole bunch of extra plunder from the battle. Abram was so confident and in such a faithful and giving mood, he gave all the plunder away to his fellow warriors and to the rightful owners of it. So you have to believe that in the wake of all of that, all of those events, Abram's confidence and trust in God must be absolutely sky high, right? You would think so. You would think so. But let's pick up right where we left off. We'll be in Genesis chapter 15, starting in verse 1, and this is right after that story of Abram's great victory. And we read this. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And then he took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And Abram believed the Lord and he credited it, credited it to him as righteousness. So in the wake of that huge military victory, in the wake of bringing home his family members, in the wake of receiving that giant piles of plunder and, and giving them all away, Abram, it appears, is being tormented by fear, somehow. Somehow in that situation, fear has managed to creep into Abram's life. Which leads us to the first question of the morning, why would Abram be afraid? What in the world is threatening him mentally, emotionally, to cause him to be fearful? I believe it's clear that he is because God wouldn't try and comfort him otherwise. God wouldn't try and fix a problem that didn't exist. So when God comes to Abram and says, don't be afraid, I have to believe that God looked at Abram's heart and said, this man is for some reason being affected by fear. So I'm thinking, what is it that Abram is afraid of? Well, don't forget that time has continued to churn on and on since God's initial promise to Abram, right? And that promise at this point in the narrative remains unfulfilled, which I think we can relate with, right? Because the the more time that ticks away between a promise and its fulfillment, 
the more anxious, fearfully anxious, and maybe even doubtful we tend to get. The more time between a promise and its realized fruition, the more nervously, anxiously fearful we tend to get. Think about it this way. Think about if you've ever had an experience where you know uh, a young lady who joyfully, lovingly accepts a proposal of marriage from her guy, right? Overjoyed excitement. And it starts immediately, the visions of the dress and the hall and the flowers and the decorations, right? And she, she talks to all of her friends and family. She starts consulting those, what I can only imagine, are very, very informative wedding magazine preparation guides that help you walk through each individual step. I didn't actually look at them myself, but I trust that they're very valuable, right? She shows the ring off to everyone. But imagine then that a year goes by, or two, or five, right? Because eventually the promise hasn't been taken back. She can still show you the ring on her finger, but at that point, if she doesn't have a date for her actual wedding, you have to wonder if she maybe starts to become fearfully anxious that this promise she was given will never actually reach fruition. Or how about something that's a little bit more everyday and ordinary for us? If any of you have ever ordered anything online, you know that long, drawn-out process of clicking purchase and then watching the progress of your order, because they give you all kinds of access. As soon as you click order, you know, they, step by step, you can watch the progress of that promise to fulfillment. And the first thing they always tell you is your order has shipped. And I'm going to tell you, they lie. They're lying to you. <laughs> they are. Because almost all the time when they say your order has shipped, it means they created a shipping label for your order. And some of you are laughing because you know, but it hasn't actually left anywhere yet. But if you watch that progression, you get to see it go from one stage to the other. And if it's something you're really, really excited about, you watch as it goes from this phase to that one to this one. We, uh, this past Christmas, we ordered something on Amazon for our daughter, just a little sort of trinkety piece of jewelry, Right? It wasn't expensive, four or five dollars, um, but it was tied to like her favorite book series and things like that. And so um, we ordered it knowing it was probably going to be shipped from China. Because if you order something on Amazon and the window of time they give you for arrival is like three weeks, you know it's probably coming from China directly. But the bulk of that time frame was before Christmas. So we thought, we'll probably be, it'll probably arrive before Christmas, right? So we clicked order and we waited and waited. We ordered, I think, November 28th or 29th, right? And so we waited and waited, thinking it should get here by Christmas. It didn't get there by Christmas, or New Year's, or the end of the month of January. <laughs> yeah. So we're just kind of stuck. Eventually, it gets to be February. Like, well, because if it showed up, we're just going to give it to her for her birthday or whenever. And so I sent a message to the seller. I said, I don't know what happened, but, you know, it's, it never arrived. And they were like, we're so sorry. We have no idea what happened. On our end, it looks like it went, but... You know, so they refunded the four or five bucks, and they said, if it ever shows up, you guys can just keep it, you know, for your trouble, whatever. I kid you not, three days later, it arrives in the mail. So, but, but we do that. We, we click purchase, and we watch every incremental step until we see that magic phrase, out for delivery. Because we know then that the promise is about to be fulfilled. I wonder if Abram is thinking back about this promise that God has made to him, and yet he doesn't see the fulfillment of that promise actually happening, and he's getting nervously, anxiously fearful about it. Not only that, Abram just completed what I would call a heroic task, revealing his courage and his commitment to his extended family, right? Not, not his direct family. This is his nephew. This is extended family. And I can almost feel Abram thinking, God, if I show this much courage and commitment to my extended family, how am I not worthy of my own family? What more can I do to prove to you that I deserve my own family? And you've already promised it. And I don't think it's just Abram that has to deal with that. I think it's all of us because the more we feel like we're doing for God, the more deserving we feel we are, and the more 
we feel shortchanged when things don't work out as we think they should on our particular timetable. The busier we are doing things that we think are pleasing to God, and they probably are, we feel like, hey, I'm putting in my end of the bargain, pal. So what's the wait? So for whatever reason, maybe these or others, Abram has this fear creeping in to his life. And God knows. Did you notice Abram doesn't actually verbally talk about his fear? He doesn't vocalize it. It just says that God approaches him, knowing his heart, I believe. And he says essentially to Abram in so many words, he says, trust me. He reassures Abram by speaking in a way that relates to his recent victory, which I think is interesting. He says, Abram, I am your what? I am your shield and your very great reward. Well, Abram just completed this military mission to get Lot back, and I'm sure the shield kind of takes him back to that moment. And the reward probably takes him back to this giant pile of plunder he brought back as well. So God speaks to him in a way that connects to these recent things. And I think if nothing else, this little snippet teaches us one thing. Sometimes God reminds us that he is our source of provision, even in our areas of strength. Like if you're Abram and God says to you, Abe, Abe, I am your shield and your great reward. I can almost see Abram going, shield? Did you see what I did to those guys on the battle? I don't need that. A great reward? Come on. I gave away all the plunder. I think sometimes we get so stuck in the areas of life that we feel our strengths for us, we forget that even in our strongest moments, it is still truly God's provision that's being poured out on our lives, even in those moments and those areas of strength. But then we see Abram's emptiness is exposed because he speaks after God addresses him. And we see that the source of Abram's fear is revealed. He has no heir by which to realize that great nation that he was promised. I mean, that was God's initial promise to him. I'll make you a great nation and all the peoples of earth will be blessed through you. And Abram's now looking in his tent at his wife and no children to be found. So we see where the fear is rooted. It's rooted in this feeling of emptiness. He says, God, I have no heir. You have left me childless. I have nothing and no one that will follow me in life. And I love it that really what Abram is doing is just conversing with God about God's initial promise, almost saying, you're the one who started this. You're the one who approached me. You're the one who told me this is the way things would go, and now I don't see it happening. I think it's a great reminder to us that we should not be afraid to talk to God about the promises that we feel have gone unfulfilled. I mean, there's no guarantee that God will hear us and then immediately address our concerns, but clearly God is a God of conversation. He wants us to speak with him. God approaches Abram, says, don't be afraid. He opens that door of conversation so that Abram can walk through and voice his concerns. Don't ever be afraid to speak with God about promises you feel are still not yet fulfilled. God would much rather hear about your frustration with unfulfilled promises than to have you walk away from the conversation entirely, which we're tempted to do sometimes. Now, it's hard to overstate the feeling of emptiness that went along with this lack of a male heir in Abram's culture particularly. I mean, if you look throughout the Old Testament, being childless is just one of the worst possible social things that you could imagine for a family, I mean, for a woman especially, and for Uh, a guy like Abram to not have especially a male child by which the family line would be continued and would inherit all of these things that Abram has built up. I mean, just for a glimpse of it, listen to Genesis 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister, and so she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die, right? Right? So it's hard, I think, for us, so far removed culturally and time-wise, to understand this moment, especially for Abram. For instance, just, just culturally speaking, if Abram knew that there was a male child coming, he would, he would probably think about his own funeral, which is kind of strange when you think about it, but bear with me for a second. Because 
a, a male child specifically was necessary if you, as a patriarch, as a father like Abram was, if you're going to be properly mourned and remembered because upon your death, there's a Jewish prayer called the Kaddish. And I think that's pronounced right, um, mostly because it sounded Jewish to me, and it seems to go along with the word as I, as I read it. So there's this Jewish prayer that upon, upon your death, your firstborn son and actually all of your, your male heirs would then pray this prayer for you in remembrance and honor and mourning for 11 months after your death three times a day. So for Abram to know, there is no one to honor me, memorialize me, remember me after I'm gone because God, you have not come through on your promise. That sense of emptiness. And again, I want to reiterate, when you feel the pangs of emptiness in your life, any kind of emptiness, cry out to God. Don't be silent. Don't walk away from the conversation. Whatever pockets of your life feel like they might be empty right now, whatever promises seem to be unfulfilled, bring those empty feelings to God. Ask Him to sustain you until the time that He fulfills what he has promised to do. So Abram cries out about this emptiness, and what does he receive in response? He receives what I would call, and I borrow this phrase from a famous hymn, he receives blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Because God reassures Abram that this promise he made to him is still good. Despite the experience of of things to the contrary, this promise that he made is still good. He reiterates that promise. You will still have a son, your own flesh and blood. But beyond the promise that Abram hears, God goes beyond it and asks him to do what? Step outside your tent, look up, and see the stars. Interesting, isn't it? I feel like it's as if God was speaking to Abram and Abram could hear the voice of the Lord saying, it's going to be okay. You're going to have an heir. Your offspring will still be there. But it's almost as if the voice itself wasn't penetrating far enough into Abram's heart. So God says, listen, Abe, go outside and look up at the night sky. Look up at the stars. There's something about the stars that still draws us even today. I mean, thousands of years later, we're still drawn to the stars. My son got a telescope for, I don't remember, Christmas, birthday at some point, and there was a clear night a couple weeks ago when he was just this light bulb, like, we need to look at this, get my telescope. And he runs upstairs, brings it back down, trying to figure out how to set it up and extend all the, whatever, the supports and how to steer it the correct way and how do you look in it and which lens do you use and... You know, we asked the question, son, when you opened this present, did you keep the instructions? Uh, that's the answer right there. So, so we tried to figure it out. The best we could really do was kind of a, a shimmery, glowing thing at the end of the telescope. But I'll tell you, the time that I was most overwhelmed by the stars, and that's a word I, I genuinely use, uh, was when I was on a mission trip to Window Rock, Arizona, the first time I was there. And when you're out there in the middle of that desert environment and you're sort of in a canyon and there's nothing above you to obstruct your view, there's not many lights because it's not a very populated area, and the sun goes down and the night settles in and you look, and you, you do, you feel like, you, it, like it might just fall on you because the vast sky and there are so many stars that you can see. And it does something to you. I think it's captured really well in Psalm 8, verses 3 and 4. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars that you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? It's the feeling you get when you look at the stars. And I like to believe that there was sort of this pause between when God said, Abe, come outside and just look up. Can you count the stars, Abe? Go ahead, try and count the stars. And I like to believe there's this pause where Abram just kind of is taking it all in, maybe even starts to count. One, two, three, four, five. I gotta start over. One, two, three, four, right? And then after a little bit of pause, God says, that is what your offspring will be like. More numerous than you could ever even try to count. Look at the stars and remember. 
I think this looking at the stars is a way that God invites Abram to look beyond the promise itself to the one who's actually making the promise to him. Abram's fixated on the promise, and I would say rightly so. He's troubled. But this invitation to look at this gigantic night sky, I think is an invitation for Abram. Don't just remember the promise. Remember the one who made the promise to you. God is still God, and he is still good. And how does Abram respond to that stargazing moment? Trust and righteousness are a result. I find it interesting there is no record of Abram responding verbally to God after he sees the stars and connects it to his offspring. He doesn't say anything, and yet the next thing we read is that Abram Abram believed and God credited it to him as righteousness. So something changed in Abram's heart, even if it didn't come out of his mouth. I think just like God saw the fear, God saw the change in his heart that was happening in that moment. And this is really key, really crucial, because some, this is something that hit me this week. Abram, in that moment, received no new data, but a fresh experience instead. No new information, right? It's not like God laid out some more evidence or some more bullet points or anything like that. Nothing. No new data or information, but instead a fresh experience. And I think this is especially pertinent for our world today because we live in a world where we're on information overload constantly. I mean, it used to just be if you turned on your car radio or you watched television, but now we have this magical, wonderful, sometimes scary and awkward thing called the internet that just keeps piling and piling and piling the information on. And how quickly does it pile up? Well, I'll tell you because I was interested to find out for myself. So these statistics are from September of 2016, so they're already kind of old, but listen to this. Every single day, one day, in one day, more than 4 million hours of content are uploaded to YouTube. Every day, 4 million hours. Every day, there are 500 million tweets sent on Twitter. Every day, there are 3.6 billion likes on Instagram. There are 4.3 billion Facebook posts. Billion with a B. as a lot of bored people swiping on their phones. Six billion daily Google searches. And if you don't recognize these Facebook, Instagram, Twitter things, and you're just old-fashioned by tech standards... Every day, there are 205 billion emails sent. Every day. We are on data overload. But what it tempts us to believe, I think, is that if we just get more or better data, better information, then we'll be good. But this story says no. Because Abram didn't receive new or better information. He received a new experience with God. And my friends, I think that's what we actually need. This faith and trust that Abram settles into in that moment is not superficial and passive. It's not just like, oh, yeah, you're right, God. You're right. You're right. It it is is, uh, deep. It is hard-earned. Abram only receives this, this faith, this trust. He only exercises it after this conversation with God, this back and forth about, Abram, I'm your reward and your shield, but God, I'm childless, but look at the stars. It takes a while to get Abram to this point. This is not easy faith. This is not easy trust or easy belief. It's something Abram has to forge as if he's a blacksmith. But he eventually realizes or maybe remembers that the only connection between his empty present And the promised future is the character of the God who called him in the first place. Abram cannot fast forward his own story. He cannot advance his own narrative even one step. But it seems like he's reminded in this moment that the only way to get from this empty feeling present to the promised future is by trusting in the character of the God who called him into this covenant. The Hebrew word that's used there for believe, that Abram believed the Lord, is actually connected to ideas of stability and support and confidence. It's a word that's linked uh, like to pillars, strong pillars, 
or the foundation of a house, or even the cradling arms of a mother holding a child, a place of safety, a place of strength, a place of stability, a place of support, which I think tells us that when Abram believes God, it's not simply mental assent to a list of claims. It's not as if Abram is listing out a bullet list and saying, yeah, I believe, I believe, or there's a lot of check uh, check, check boxes, and Abram's going, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that, just mentally. But instead, he's moving just from his mental capacity to his heart and to his soul, saying that I, I, I trust this firm place, this place of strength and security. You and I are invited not to simply believe things about God, but to actually trust in God. There's a huge, huge difference between those. Believing things about God and trusting in God. In the Jewish culture, they had a metaphor for this, and they would talk about when a a man gets old enough to use a cane, how he has to lean onto that cane in order to be supported. And that this kind of belief is a leaning into belief, leaning into a place of stability and strength and support. Not just believing up here, but believing with everything that we are. And it's Abram's trust, belief, and faith in God, we are told, that make him righteous. He believed, and God credited it to him as righteousness. And this is the last crucial thing I want to make sure we understand. Because it's critical to make sure we know that Abram is not described as doing righteousness, but as receiving righteousness. So many times we get righteousness confused and we believe that righteousness is something that we collect, that we accumulate by the things that we do. But Abram doesn't do anything but one thing. He trusts God. Jesus, in John chapter 6, feeds a whole bunch of people, bread and fish and things like that, and then they chase after him and have these conversations with him, and eventually somebody says to him, what kind of works do I need to do to do the work of God? And do you know what his answer is? Believe in the one that God has sent. Over those thousands of years, nothing changed. Righteousness is not accumulated by the works that we do. Righteousness is is what we receive when we simply say, God, I will lean into you. I trust that you will be that strong support that I need in my life. We don't believe in rituals, rules, or righteous deeds. None of those things are bad. Rituals, if they're meaningful and engaging for us, they're not bad things, but our trust doesn't rely on rules and rituals, but on the triune God, on the, on the Father who spoke to Abram, on the Son who went to a cross for us and then conquered death through that empty grave, on the Holy Spirit who fills each one of us and then continues to direct and guide His church here on this earth. That is the only place where our trust deserves to settle. So as we finish our time together, I want to hit a few questions that we can consider in our hearts and minds today as we respond to the story of Abram's life. First off, what kind of fears have been creeping into your life lately? Confess them openly to God. Don't hide. Don't pretend they're not there. Confess the fear that might be creeping in. Secondly, is there some type of emptiness that you've been feeling recently? Ask God to sustain you and to fill you according to His will and His timing for your life. Third, consider the stars in the sky. And I actually invite you, sometime this week, go out at nighttime and actually look up at the sky. Be overwhelmed by the glory of creation. But consider the sky, the sheer numbers of stars, the tremendous distances that are involved, and thank God that you are still lovingly noticed by Him. In the span of that, those huge distances, the numbers of stars and galaxies in the universe, and yet God looks at you and lovingly knows you and notices you, and that is a phenomenal thing worthy of celebration. Lastly, do you need to move from believing things about God to trusting in God? And there's a big space between those two things, between believing things about God and leaning in and trusting that he's the one who deserves to be the foundation for your life. So take a moment or two if you want to close your eyes, if you want to pray 
If you just want to read through those words, I trust the Spirit will speak to your heart during this time of silent reflection, and then we're going to just sing a couple verses of one more song together.